In this video, you will understand and identify the properties of multiplication. You will know the difference between prime and composite numbers. And you will also learn to find the greatest common factor. So to begin, we have different parts of a multiplication problem. So for example, if you had 3 times 7, we know the answer would be 21. Now the numbers that we are multiplying together, so the 3 and the 7, those are called factors. And then the answer of a multiplication problem is called the product. So make sure you know these terms because you will see these a lot in your study of mathematics. So we have factor and product. Now with multiplication, there are different ways to express multiplication in math. We could use your traditional times sign right here, so 4 times 5. But also we can use a raised dot. So a dot in between the 4 and the 5 also means multiplication. Notice it is not a decimal point. A decimal point is down lower and is level with the bottom of 4 and 5, whereas the multiplication symbol, this raised dot, is in the middle of 4 and 5. So that is a little bit different than a decimal point. So in addition to these, we could also use parentheses. So if we have a parentheses around the 5, for example, that would mean we're multiplying 4 and 5 together. The parentheses could also be with the 4, the first number, or it could be with both numbers. So all of these expressions mean the same thing. This all means multiplication. So be familiar of these different ways to express multiplication because you can see any of these uh, different ways as you progress in your study of math. Now with multiplication, there are some properties that will always be true. The first is called the commutative property. So in English, this property says that the order of multiplication does not make a difference. So in math notation, we would say a times b equals b times a. So it doesn't matter if the a comes first or the b comes first. So with actual numbers, we have here 4 times 5 equals 5 times 4. This is the same thing. So it does not matter if the 4 is first when I multiply or the 5 is first. And this is your commutative property. Now a way to remember the name of this property and the way to associate that with, uh, with this example is in English the word commute. So commute in English uh, has the idea of moving or traveling. So your parents might commute to work each day, meaning they're driving to work, or they have to travel to work. So commute has the idea of moving. All right, so here the commutative property, we see that word commute. So commute means moving. So with this example, with this property, um, what's moving is the numbers. So the numbers can move around and still have the same outcome. Next we have what is called the associative property. So in English, we can describe this as the grouping of the factors. So the grouping of the factors does not make a difference when you multiply. So in math notation, if we have three numbers, A, B, C, it doesn't matter if we group together in parentheses the A and the B, or if we group together the B and the C, we get the same outcome. So with actual numbers plugged in, for example, here we have 3 times 4 in parentheses times 5. Then over here, we have 4 and 5 in parentheses and then times 3. It doesn't matter how we group things together. So looking at this more carefully, what we're saying is that it does not matter if I do 3 times 4 first to get 12 times 5 because 12 times 5 is 60. And then on the right side, if I decided to multiply the 4 and the 5 together first, we would have 3 times 4 times 5 is 20, and 3 times 20 is also 60. So when you have three numbers or more being multiplied together, it does not matter which numbers you multiply first. 
and that is your associative property. Now a way to remember the associative property and to connect that with this example here is we see within the word associative, we see the word associate. So associate. Now that word in English has the idea of being a part of or being grouped with something or someone. So if you associate with a particular group of people, that means you're part of that group. All right, so the same idea here in math is the associative property has to do with the grouping. Okay, just like with people, associate means you're part of a group. Same thing with math, the numbers can be parts of different groups. And it doesn't matter how I group them together, we get the same outcome. And the grouping in math is being done with the parentheses. So that's how we know which numbers are in the group. So we've had commutative property, we've had the associative property, next we have what is called the identity property. So the identity property for multiplication says that there's a number that we can multiply by that does not change the identity of the original number. And that number is 1. So in English you can multiply by 1 and that does not change the original value. In math notation, we can say a times 1 equals a. We started with a, multiply by 1, the answer is still going to be some number a. With actual numbers, if we had 8 times 1, we know 8 times 1 is equal to 8 because again, multiplying by 1 does not change the original identity or value. We started with 8, multiply by 1, the identity is still the same with 8. So that is your identity property. Next we have what is called the zero property. Now it makes sense that the zero property has to do with multiplying by zero. So the zero property says that anything times zero will always equal zero. In math notation, if we have some value a, we multiply by zero, the answer is going to be zero. With actual numbers, let's say we had 8 times 0, 8 times 0 would also equal 0, because anything times 0 will always equal 0. Next we have what is called the distributive property. So this one uh, is just easier to show an example instead of trying to explain in English. And this example we have 5 times and then 30 plus 7 in parentheses. So what the distributive property says is that I can distribute or take this 5 and share it with the 3 and the 7 both in the parentheses. So I would have 5 times 30, so 5 times 30 right here, and then plus we can share the 5 with the other number, the 7. So we have plus 5 times 7. So the 5 on the outside of parentheses is multiplied with the 30 and also the 7. And that is your distributive property. And then we could finish this off. 5 times 30 is 150. And then 5 times 7 is 35. So then 150 plus 35 is 185. Now remember though that Multiplication does not require to have the time sign. How I could write this instead would be 5 and then just the parentheses. So 5 and then parentheses 30 plus 7. Because remember the number in front of or next to the parentheses means multiplication. So these two things are the same expression just written in different ways. And most often, as you progress in your study of mathematics, we will typically use this notation over here. So we'll begin to not use the time sign very often at this point. And also, this concept of distributing, or using the distributive property, can be very helpful for doing mental, uh, mental calculations. 
So for example, if you had 4 times 58, and you were told to calculate this in your head. Okay, at first you might think, well, it's going to be kind of difficult, but it makes it easier if you can think of this as distributing. So this 58, if we write it like we have it over here, as two numbers being added together, we can use the distributive property. So 58, we can think of that as 50 plus 8. Right, that's the same thing. 50 plus 8 is 58. So when I do this in my head, I can think through, okay, 4 times 50, so 4 times that first number, so 4 times 50, and then plus, we take the 4 and multiply it by the 8, so 4 times 8 as well. So we're sharing that 4 with both numbers. So 4 times 50 is 200, 4 times 8 is 32. So that is a pretty quick problem to do in your head from this point. 200 plus 32 is 232. And that is our answer. So be aware of how to use the distributive property because uh, later as you progress into algebra, uh, it's gonna be very crucial in your study of algebra, but also immediately it can help you with doing mental calculations. So for those two reasons, it is important to know the distributive property. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to discuss the concept of factors. So remember, factors are the numbers that are being multiplied to get an answer. So if you had like 4 times 7 equals 28, 4 is a factor and 7 is a factor. And then 28 would be the product, the answer. So here we see an example where we are to find the factors of 20. Or in other words, what numbers, what whole numbers would multiply together to get 20. So to get 20, we could do 1 times 20. We could do 2 times 10. Or we can do 4 times 5. So We've thought through all the combinations of ways to multiply whole numbers to get to 20. And so now we can list out the factors of 20 to be the numbers you see listed. We have 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, and 20. So those are all the factors of 20. So let's try another example. What if you were told to find the factors of 24? Well, what numbers, what whole numbers will multiply to get 24? Well, we could do 1 times 24, 2 times 12, we could do 3 times 8, or we can do 4 times 6. These are all ways to get 24. So the factors would be the numbers you see right here. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, and 24. So those all would be the factors. All right, now if you're told to find the common factors between 20 and 24. So what common factors do we have with 20 and 24? So looking at 20 and 24 and their factors, we see that they both have a one, they both have a two, and they both have a four. So the common factors of 20 and 24 are one, two, and four. And then there's this concept of what is called the greatest common factor. So what is the biggest factor that both numbers have in common? Well, the biggest factor we see that they both have is the number four, right? That is the largest factor that they have in common. So the greatest common factor of 20 and 24 is four. And this concept of greatest common factor is going to be very important for many different aspects in math. So it is important to know how to find these numbers. So for this lesson, we just will list out the factors and see which ones they have in common and find the biggest common factor. In the future, you'll learn a different technique where you can uh, kind of calculate the greatest common factor, which would be helpful for like really large numbers. All right, but for now, you can just work on listing the factors out for both numbers and then seeing what they have in common and seeing which one is the biggest number that they have in common.
And now let's switch over to prime versus composite numbers. So these are two different categories of numbers. And for prime numbers, the numbers that fall into that category would be numbers that have only two factors. So only two numbers that can multiply to get to that particular number. And that's gonna be the numbers one and itself. All right, so we'll look at examples here in a moment. Um, but composite numbers is the opposite. And composite numbers has more than two factors. So looking for prime numbers. Prime numbers, the smallest number that we begin with is gonna be two. All right, because the only way to get two is by doing one times two. So it only has two factors, right? The only factors is one and two. Looking at the next number, three, three is also prime because the only way to get three is by doing one times three, right? There's no other way to get three by multiplying whole numbers together. So this number three would also be prime. Now, the next number, four, four, we can get four by doing one times four, but we also could do two times two. So here we have more than two factors. We have one, two, another two, which we don't count again, but we have one, two, and then four. So that's three different factors. So for that reason, that's gonna be composite. And then we look at five. Five, the only way to get five is one times five. So this would be prime because the only two factors are one and then five. Now six, six we can do one times six or two times three. So because it's, it's got more than two factors, this would be composite. So six would be composite. Seven, we do one times seven. And that's the only way to get, uh, get seven back out. So that would be prime. Okay, and we can keep going for all these if we want. Eight would be composite because we can do one times eight, but we can also do two times four. So that would be composite because we have uh, different ways, uh, more, more than two factors, right? We have more than just one and eight. We also have two and four. So that would be composite. So we could keep going for every single number, uh, but that's the thought process behind determining what numbers are prime or composite. And by the way, in English, uh, the word composite, we see uh, the word, the main word compose. Compose means it's made up of more than one thing. So the word composite has the idea of being made up of more than just uh, with factors of one in itself. So composite has the idea of more than just those two factors. It's made up of other factors as well. Okay, so make sure you know the difference between prime and composite numbers. And then lastly, we have the concept of multiples. So the, the concept is kind of found in the word itself. So multiples has the idea of multiplying. So if you want to list the multiples of six, what we do is we multiply six by one, and then six times two, and six times three, etc. So six times one would be six, six times two is 12, six times three is 18, times four is 24, times five is 30, and etc. So the multiples of six you see listed here. We just multiply six by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we keep going. And then, if we have a different example, let's say we want to find the multiples of 8. Again, the multiples of 8, we would find by multiplying 8 by 1, then 8 times 2, then 8 times 3. And we keep going, and we get this list of numbers right here. So then, just like with the, the factors, we found the, the common factors. Same thing with multiples. We can look and try to find the common multiples. Uh, so this one, um, we look through the list. We have 24 in common. We have 48 in common. And if we keep the multiples going, we would find that there's an infinite number of, of common multiples. So it's going to be 24, 48, and etc. It's going to keep going. Now with multiples, 
we are concerned primarily with what is called the least common multiple. So the smallest multiple that both numbers have in common. So the smallest common multiple, the least one, would be 24. So the least common multiple of 6 and 8 is 24. So again, with, with multiples, just like with, uh, with factors, we will find the least common multiple by listing out the multiples of different numbers. And then we see which one uh, is the smallest that they have in common. As you progress in your study of mathematics, you will learn later that there's a method that we can use to find or to calculate the least common multiple. And that's primarily useful for large numbers. And then once we start throwing in um, different algebra concepts, this can be very helpful for that. Um, so it is important to, important to know how to find the least common multiple as well as the greatest common factor and the other things discussed in this lesson. And that concludes our lesson for today. We will see you next time.